And so the winner of our most recent character analysis poll by some margin, and the subject of today's video, is the mysterious third Espada, the Shark Empress herself, Tia Harabel. One of the rare water users in the world of Bleach, which is already something that makes her stand out, makes her unique, and is really interesting about this character. However, at the same time, I would say Haribel suffers from a fatal flaw, that being that she isn't given anywhere near the amount of time she needed or deserved to really make an impact. Which is all the more weird considering her station within the law as one of the major villains of the Arankar arc. Now, I'll admit I was a little naive going into this poll as I thought that Soifon was going to win it for one major reason alone, being that I'm well aware that on this channel, despite being something of a major supporting character, Soifon has yet to receive anything really in the way of a spotlight video, character analysis, character study, anything like that, she hasn't yet had it. Whereas as recently as a few months ago, we just looked at Harabel's anime-only backstory in a video of its own, so I thought Soifon might stand more of a chance here, but I was wrong. I overestimated her popularity in the face of the might of the Queen of Waco Mundo herself, forgetting, of course, that Harabel well and truly is one of the most popular female characters in Bleach, if not one of the most popular characters in the series in general. But I'm alright with that, and this whole video is going to be taking a look at what exactly it is about Harabel that, despite her tiny amount of screen time, lent her to be so popular among fans and to be such a major, iconic, and recognisable figure among the Arankar. And I think she's a really interesting character in her own right. As I mentioned, she's enigmatic, she's strange, there is something ethereal and weird about this character, which we're going to do a deeper dive into. However, as we have been doing lately, I also want to take into account the runner-up. And so the next character analysis video we do will be on the captain of the second division, Soifon. Before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well, as it does help to support me and the channel, and it hopefully just means we'll get more traction on the YouTube algorithm. But of course, if you want to take that support from me another step further, you can do so as we have a Patreon for the channel as well. You obviously don't have to support me there at all, but if you did decide to, you can get videos like this one early, and you can support me for as little as a dollar a month. To everyone who already is supporting me over there, as always, uh, just a huge shout out goes out to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for taking that support that extra step further. It really does mean the world to me. So, the third Espada of Aizen's army, Tia Harabel, and what better place to start off this video than right there, with her name, as I've seen a bit of confusion about how it's pronounced and spelt over the years. There seems to be two different variations, Tia Harabel and Tia Halabel, double R and L. So which one is correct? Well, really, both are absolutely fine. In fact, I used to call her Halabel way back when the Arankar arc was still coming out weekly, because that was how it was translated into the West, and that translation carried over into the official Viz manga as well. So you'll find in those books behind me, Tia Halabel. So why then do I call her Harabel? Why do so many other people call her Harabel? As far as I'm concerned, that is the de facto correct way to spell her name, as that is how Kubo himself wrote it on her character chapter cover, and for me, that's all I need. That's good enough for me, for me to call her and spell it that way moving forwards. And that's how I always have done with this channel. But really, it doesn't particularly matter whichever way you choose. But if I was to describe Tia Harabel in one word, it would be a word that you wouldn't normally associate with Hollows or Aranka or anything of that ilk. And I think that immediately tells you a lot about this character. It tells you that there's something odd about her that makes her stand out from her contemporaries. And that word is humanity, in so much as Harabel seems to have a lot of it, especially compared to the rest of the Espada. 
The only Espada I would say that really comes anywhere near to Harabel's seemingly perceived level of humanity, of compassion, of caring, kindness, and love would be a character like Coyote Stark, and ironically both of these characters are obviously Vasto Lord, to the point where they have achieved near perfect human forms both in and out of their resurrection. And humanity is a funny and fascinating concept when related to the Arankar, in so much as intentionally or not, it is what they are all striving to achieve. Now, some of them might reject that notion. Characters like Ulkiora, who upon being told he might be becoming more human, seems to become enraged at the idea. Ulkiora, for instance, believes it's normal that humans would imitate hollows to achieve greater power, but what he seems to fail to understand is that by becoming Arankar, it is the hollows that are leaving behind their bestial, animalistic, vicious selves. But how well does humanity really even suit Waco Mundo? Is it even natural in any way? Hollows have been depicted in Bleach as being these depraved, animalistic beings who are missing something. There is a gaping hole in their very being that means that at a fundamental level they aren't quite, well, whole. They live in a pitch black world that light cannot pierce, and it takes a false light being shined upon them by Aizen when he conquers Waco Mundo to change the way these beings think and feel. He seems to force a civility upon them that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. These creatures, no matter how human they may appear, still retain their hollow traits of insanity, of madness, of anger, of lust, of wanting to devour everything they can to fill that void. They would never have come together were it not for Aizen himself. And yet, Harabel is a character who seems to thrive in this newfound civilization. She is one of the most human of all the Arankar, no question about it. She can feel compassion, she cares for her fraction, unlike virtually every other Espada, again, Stark being the only one who can really be on her level in that regard. Now, with a manga lifespan stretching from chapter 198 right the way through to chapter 485, you might think that Harabel has a pretty big role to play. But unfortunately, she really doesn't, and she's mostly a background character until her big fight, which I have my own issues with, and we'll get to that a bit later on. And then, when the Thousand Year Blood War arc comes around, she really is only in it for one chapter, and then totally disappears again. This all means that despite the intricacies of this character, despite the personality traits that make her truly interesting and make her stand out from the crowd, and, ironically make her a fitting leader for Waco Mundo after Aizen's fall, she never really gets too much time to really show any of that off. But let's talk about that as well, why Harabel was perfectly poised to become the queen of Waco Mundo in the aftermath of the war against Aizen. It makes total sense, and I actually love this as well, because Kubo arbitrarily allowed some Arankar to live, but I like that by keeping Harabel alive, it allowed a big, major change to happen in Waco Mundo itself. The false light of Aizen is gone in Waco Mundo. This fake idea of civilization seemingly is gone, but Harabel doesn't want to see the world descend back into madness, descend back into that cavernous black pit of insanity, of free-for-all, of dog-eat-dog, and she wants to try and retain some level, some semblance of humanity, despite it not necessarily being their true state. But I also like that after the war, she basically doesn't want to be the leader of Waco Mundo. I think, again, that is perfect. She seems to have this great understanding that Waco Mundo doesn't need a sunlight shining down upon it. Hollows just want to be left alone within the darkness. But at the same time, she steps up to the plate to stop it all from descending into utter chaos. But we're skipping ahead quite a way here. A lot of what Harabel does in the aftermath of the Arankar arc plays a role in Can't Fear Your Own World. I actually have a plan to do a few videos in the future looking at where certain characters and races are and end up 
in that supplementary sequel to The Thousand Year Blood War. But needless to say, Harabel plays a cool and really intriguing role as the new ruler of Waco Mundo, bringing it into a new age as a legitimate faction in the world of Bleach. And actually, this video should be a really nice accompaniment to the last one we did about Harabel, which again was about her anime-only backstory. Now we're looking at her appearance, her role in the canon manga. Among the Espada, Harabel always really felt and looked like a Vasto Lord. She carries herself in that way. Her nature is to be very calm, composed and collected while her contemporaries, her colleagues are all squabbling or all fighting like maniacs. Harabel really is nothing like that. And so because of that, again, much like Stark, she's always felt like a cut above the rest. And I think her power level, again, in this series is really undersold big time. I don't think she gets anywhere near the showing that she deserved. But going back to this idea of humanity and the innate humanity that lives within Harabel, I think maybe a lot of that stems from her aspect of death, which is sacrifice, which is a really cool aspect of death as it implies, again, compassion. It implies, again, dying perhaps for a cause or for somebody you love, for someone else. This idea of sacrifice is essentially at its core an idea of giving, whether forced or not, but with Harabel it certainly seems to be implied that it's not force, that she is giving herself, sacrifice is intrinsic to her being. And I really like that. It shows again that she believes in a greater cause. She understands the concept of a greater cause and of fighting and dying for that cause, which I think explains an awful lot about why she is so suddenly enraged when Aizen betrays her, because it's like everything that she was willing to sacrifice herself for shatters before her very eyes. Now, unfortunately, because Harabel doesn't get any kind of a backstory in the manga itself, her aspect of death, I think, goes a little unexplored. But there are definitely a few hints to towards the impact this aspect of death has on her in the story. First and foremost, her fraction, who we've discussed already that she actually cares for, she's very close to them, they are sacrificed essentially at the altar of Yamamoto. Now, he doesn't kill them, but there's no necessarily way of knowing that if you're Harabel in the heat of the moment. Yamamoto has just completely obliterated your three comrades who are effectively family at this point, and that really forces Harabel into action. Prior to that, she'd been fighting, I guess, somewhat lethargically, sizing Hitsugaya up, no pun intended. And it's only after Yamamoto takes them down that they are sacrificed that Harabel is able to really start getting into the fight. That's when she literally just attacks Hitsugaya. She just goes crazy against him, forces him into Bankai, and then uses her own resurrection. But it's interesting, in Harabel's anime-only backstory, she mentions that she's well aware that no world can exist without sacrifice. Everything is built on the back of sacrifice. One of my absolute favourite lines from Mayuri Kurotsuchi is his line against Pernida Pankajaz, where he mentions that no Noble victories are built on the backs of noble sacrifices. And that's exactly how Harabel views the world, but at the same time, despite understanding the world, despite knowing what kind of a world she comes from, Harabel doesn't want to be the cause of those sacrifices. She doesn't want to be the one who gains power at the expense of others, that sacrifices others to increase her own strength. This is, of course, the total antithesis to what it means to be a hollow. Hollows literally live and die by this creed, eating others, sacrificing others to gain more strength. Harabel doesn't want that at all. But of course, later, she herself would be sacrificed by Aizen, effectively, after he decides that he's had enough of this and he simply wants to move on. Although Harabel is fighting for him, fighting for his cause, he just puts her down and moves on with his plan. He effectively does sacrifice her to get her out of the way. And because of that, she falls from battle. And I think that's a really interesting way to bring this character down. A number of Espada are effectively defeated by their own aspects of death, which was always a really cool idea. Idea. And Harabel's is, I feel, quite literal in that she's taken down by one of her own comrades just to move on with his goals. So moving on now to talk about Harabel's design and her personality, this character's overall visuals 
I think she does look iconic. There's definitely something really cool about the way Harabelle looks, where she just looks unlike any other character in the series. And of course, Kubo is playing up the mystery of what's going on with her face, because much like a character from, say, the Thousand Year Blood War arc, like as not, we want to know what's going on behind whatever is concealed. As is wearing a mask over the bottom half of his face, Harabelle has effectively an enormous collar that goes around the entirety of her head. Really cool outfit design as well, even if there is a fair bit of fan service involved, which looks very unsuitable, particularly for a battlefield, but, you know, she's doing whatever she likes, I guess. But you want to know what's going on. You want to know what's going on behind the collar. She looks, again, very mysterious. There's something sleek about it. You know, there's something like Harabel is hiding something all this time, and it just makes the reader want to know more. And when she eventually unzips that collar, unzips her jacket, reveals her tattoo and her hollow mask, it's a pretty crazy moment. Like, it's not really at all what I was expecting. Her hollow mask is very dramatic. It covers the entire bottom half of her face with a mouth that looks like it is sealed shut, like it, like it can't move. And we see her talking and her mouth remains closed, which is weird in and of itself but her hollow mask extends down her neck across her chest it is probably one of the biggest hollow masks in the series and that's a point we'll get into a little bit later on as well but there are a lot of other really cool things about Harabelle's design too I absolutely love the kind of dark skin the tanned skin mixed with a sort of shock of lightning yellow hair coming across three different ponytails looking very ferocious I think that's a really cool look the massive hollowed out broadsword that she wears across the short of her back really just a great design. Again, Kubo firing on all cylinders. It's absolutely no wonder that this character is so synonymous with the Iran car and with Bleach in general. But okay, what is going on with her hollow mask? How does she talk, for starters? Because she does talk and the mouth doesn't seem to move. So is this just one of those things where it's a magical fantasy series and you're just supposed to forget about it? Or maybe she has her normal face, as we see in her Resurrection, underneath that mask the whole time and is still able to talk normally. Now, as a spiritual being of some description, presumably she needs to eat and drink, as we find out in Soul Society, Shinigami beings with spiritual pressure need to, they get hungry, basically, is what I'm getting at. But Harabel, can she do any of that? Does it even matter if she can't? Is Aizen placing a cup of tea in front of her, him his way of making fun of her? Or is he putting it there just to let her feel included? Because she's definitely not drinking it. That's all really weird. You know, I kind of get the impression that the hollow mask was done just because it looks really cool. And it does look really cool as well. It was a bit of a shocking moment to see her looking so ferocious, I guess. Once she removes that vestige of humanity, which is an item of clothing, she looks a lot more sinister and monstrous underneath, which I thought was honestly really cool design. And it makes her Resurrection baffle me a little bit more. We'll get into the Resurrection in a minute. Harabelle's entire theme is supposed to be a shark. I wouldn't necessarily say this mask looks like a shark at all, I don't think. Um, it's again quite a human looking jaw, at least, anyway, um, which again is perhaps supposed to really make you think this is a Vasto Lord. But then moving on to her Resurrection, things get a little bit weird with this design, if I'm totally honest with you. Now, her Resurrection is Tiburon with the command Hunt, which again is really cool. Again, very literally, this is a shark theme she's got going on here. But I mean, at the end of the day, to be very sort of reductive about it, it kind of just removes her clothes. And I'm not necessarily the world's biggest fan of that, especially when some of the other Espada uh, Resurrections look so amazing. And what's weird about this form, I like that we get to see Harabelle's face properly. It allows her to be more emotive and more expressionful. It basically means we can read this character a lot better and she's no longer so statuesque and alien-like. But I always thought that a, an Arankar's Resurrection was supposed to be their Zanpakuto is where they effectively store all of their kind of original hollow power, and when they activate their release form, it transforms them into something closer, more akin to their original hollow form. As for the very first example we ever get of this in the series being Edrad Leones, at the start he looks basically like a human, but when he releases his Zanpakuto, he returns to a slightly more hollow state. And when we see him as an Ajukas in Grimjo's flashback, he looks 
akin to how he looks here in his release form. Same exact example with someone like Shaolong Kufong, for instance. So it's weird to me that Harabel loses the entirety of her hollow mask, and it seems to just disappear and not even reappear in a way that really makes any sense. But upon thinking about this a little bit further, I've kind of come to the conclusion that the uh, the hollow masks, particularly where the Arankar are concerned, are wildly inconsistent. So let's look at a couple of examples. For instance, Xyloporo Grands. In his base form, his hollow mask is his glasses, but when he activates his Resurrection for Nicarus, it completely vanishes. It could be those weird kind of blinkers that he has that could be the new form of his glasses. But regardless, I mean, it doesn't look like it did before. Zamari Luru is another great example with his Resurrection Brujeria. In his base form, his hollow mask is made up of disparate elements. It's the spikes on his head, the necklace he wears, the earrings that he has. And yet in his Resurrection, it's all gone. Replaced with this really strange cowl that covers his entire head, his entire neck, in like a huge multi-faced skull. Is that his hollow mask? I've no idea. Then there are characters where it makes more sense. Ulkiora, for instance, his hollow mask in his base form is pretty obvious. It's the massive horned half helmet. And when he activates his resurrection, he becomes closer to his normal hollow self, hence the massive black bat wings. And in this form, the helmet is completed. Then there's characters like Yami Largo, who in his base form has just a kind of jaw that sits underneath his face. You can see his mouth like normal. But in his Resurrection, that jaw becomes his lower jaw, which is how I always thought every Resurrection should actually work, that their hollow mask should become a natural part of their body. Then there are just oddities, like real oddities, that make the whole thing super weird. Neutra Jiruga, his hollow mask is like a sort of eye patch around his hollow hole. In his Resurrection, it barely changes, apart from getting slightly more ornate. And then there's Barragan Louisenbahn. I just have no idea what's going on with this character, really. In his base form, he has a hollow mask as a crown. And yet, when he activates his Resurrection... That disappears and is replaced by a literal crown, <laughs> like a crown made of actual metal. I have no idea how that works with a chain coming off it and everything. At the end of the day, the reality is it doesn't really matter. It's a design choice and that's about it. It just seems weird to me from a lore perspective that Harabelle's, because Harabelle's mask is so dramatic that the whole thing would just vanish. And instead, I guess it's replaced by the parts, the almost like shark teeth running down her, her body, running down her stomach, the two shark dorsal fin style wings that are now coming off of her side, she's got these gloves on, she's got these boots on, that mini skirt that looks like it's made up of bones, maybe that's all her hollow mask. As I have made comparisons between Harabelle and Stark already, it seems fitting to make one more here. As much like Harabelle, Stark loses his mask in his Resurrection. In his base form, Stark has a wolf jaw for a necklace, and when he releases, that totally disappears. However, in Stark's case, it makes a little more sense to me because he gains effectively a new hollow mask, which now resembles and represents Lilinet, which I think is exactly what Kubo was going for. They have fused, and now his hollow mask is Lilinet's hollow mask. So there, it's a very different situation to Harabel, who seems to just arbitrarily lose all vestiges of her hollow mask, pretty much. Um, and so I think that the comparison can be made, but it still is a bit of a weird situation. What's the real takeaway here, again, like I said, is that we can now see her face, and that is more important for her character. As far as her resurrection goes... I, like I said, I'm not the world's biggest fan of it. The cynic in me does feel it was just an excuse to get more of Harabelle's clothes off, while her contemporaries all have these amazing Grim Reaper, Lone Wolf, Gunslinger, emo bat forms. Harabelle is just nearly naked. But admittedly, there are some things even now that I absolutely love about this design. I think the massive shark tooth broadsword is inspired and looks really, really cool. And that's a great way of reinforcing the shark theme where it might not be so reinforced anywhere else. But as for her personality, there's not really a whole lot going on here because Harabelle does spend most of the time in the in the story being very serious, being very calm, like I said, very composed. 
very kind of on top of things, never really letting herself get too emotional, which I'll, I'll say is pretty cool, to be fair. She does kind of come across with the whole concealing of her face, the small sword, like some kind of ninja, almost. Which I actually think is, is a really cool design choice for this character, but there's not too much to go off with her personality, really. The most important parts of her personality, the most... Uh, the parts that really stick with you the most are what we already discussed about her feeling compassion towards her subordinates, towards effectively her friends and her family members. Um, and I think that's really, really, that's that's obviously the most important trait of this character. And it, like I said, bleeds into this idea of sacrifice as well. I guess at the end of the day, my maiden point to come out of this discussion is why when Harabel releases her Zanpak toe to look closer to her original hollow state, does she end up looking more human. Particularly when you look at the anime-only version of this character in her backstory, they go with what her hollow mask looks like. She has it all on her face, she has it running down her neck and her chest. So in her resurrection, you, should, you would think that that would all be there. At the end of the day, we're talking an awful lot about something that is pretty much just a design choice made by Kubo. So moving on to her role in the story, much like the other top three Espada, Harabel was kept mostly to the wayside for a lot of the time. Nowhere near as much as Barragon, who basically just appears for the Espada meeting and then never again until fake Karakura Town. But she was definitely one of the characters we really didn't see much of until that decisive battle, and that really helped to drum up hype for this character. I remember people were just so unfathomably excited for the top three Espada, myself included. But having said that, she's actually one of the very first Espada we ever see. She appears very early on in what looks to be a slightly unfinished design, or a design that changes ever so slightly later on, but she appears in chapter 198 when Ulkiora and Yami give their report to Aizen and the, the other Arankar who happened to be there at the time, which seems to consist of a bunch of random characters, including this one kind of menacing, creepy-looking Arankar who we literally never see again, Grimjo and his faction, and presumably some other Espada as well, because Harabel is there. Like I said, she looks slightly different. She has her hair kind of down, which looks kind of weird, to be honest, because we've seen her without it, with it kind of up most of the time. So having it down looks really strange. And she also only has one ponytail as well, as opposed to the three that she would later have. She later reappears along with characters like Noitora and Stark, watching over the creation of Wonderweiss. And here we can see that her design has become begun to shift into what we'd eventually know. Later, Harabel arrives with the rest of the Espada at the Espada meeting. And this is where some semblance of her personality begins to be built up. We see that she is this very soft-spoken and calm character, but who's also not willing to take any crap from anyone else. As we also get the start of Neuter's sexism as well, when he calls out against Harabel, he calls her out, and he starts to kind of have a go at her, like a sort of rabid dog gnawing at her leg. And you can see that she's mildly annoyed by this, but realistically, I imagine that she would probably be able to defeat him fairly simply. She later senses the death of Aroniero when one of her fraction Apache kind of asks her what they should do about it. Harabel remains silent. And then eventually all of them, Harabel and her fraction, are seen watching Ichigo and Grimjo do battle in their epic final clash in Waco Mundo itself, where the Fraction are getting kind of scared by the Reatsu that's coming off of these two guys, and it's really cool to see that Harabel's not really bothered about it at all. But again, unlike a lot of Arankar who might chastise their subordinates for feeling that fear, Harabel tells them that it is natural to feel that fear and they should relish it, that they should use it, and they should embrace this primal fear that they are feeling. And that's, again, really cool. Harabel is teaching them something good, something important. She's wise, and that is really rubbing off on her fraction. She does actually care for them. But then we get some introspection with Harabel as well, where she actually thinks that something weird is going on here, that it feels like it's a battle between two Espada rather than a human slash Shinigami. But Harabel's main role in the story doesn't occur until the fake Karakura Town arc, where she is summoned to the battle alongside her fraction and the other two top Espada at Aizen's command to do battle against the Soul Society in a big, epic showdown. And she clashes with Hitsugaya Toshiro while her fraction battle his vice captain Matsumoto. And I've got to be honest with you, I just want to say from the outset that I think this fight is really disappointing. 
Um, it's actually ranked pretty highly, I think, by the Japanese. It was something like 13th in one of the best bout polls. But for me, I, I'm not really sure what they're seeing here because what we're mostly getting is A, an incredibly short fight and B, a fight that just doesn't go anywhere. Now, I get the point. It's supposed to show two very evenly matched characters. And again, we'll get into that a bit later because it feels like it doesn't make too much sense either. But we're supposed to be seeing two characters whose power sets are effectively the same or at least different versions of the same power. And so they're struggling to get one up on one up on either of them. But that doesn't make for the most interesting fight ever, and eventually Kubo just decides to sort of end it. And what's absolutely crazy about this fight as well is when you think about it, when you think about characters like Noitora and Xyloporo, who are always my go-to for Espada, who got way too much screen time, they were getting, like, a volume and a half of pure fighting. If you look at Harabel's battle, and I mean really look at how much time is spent on this fight, the, the third Espada gets maybe three chapters total, at best. Maybe four, at a push, maybe four. Which is the same amount of time that Zomari got, of all characters. Somebody who is often lambasted among the Espada for being an absolute failure. But guess what? Zomari's fight at least was unbroken. Harabel's fight is not only about three chapters long, it is constantly being skipped away from. And so for me, I just find it very disappointing. But we have already kind of skipped ahead, so let's go right back to the start of Fate Karakura Town. Like I said, Harabel starts off fighting very carefully, very observant. She notices when Hitsugaya's Ryatsu flickers and tremors at the arrival of Hinamori. And that's really cool, seeing Harabel picking up on that and asking Hitsugaya what is wrong, why he feels like that. And he's obviously very guarded about it. And like I said again, once Harabel's fraction are sacrificed, essentially they go down... Harabel changes. She becomes way more intense. She reveals her tattoo, unzips her jacket, reveals her hollow mask, and again takes on this more bestial form. And she says, you know, when have I ever said that this was all my power? When have I ever said I was showing you all my power? And she just lunges at Hitsugaya as he activates his Bankai, but she just seems to demolish him, smashing into him with such unbelievable force that it sends shards of ice flying everywhere. She then activates her ability Ola Azul, which is a really cool and really sa strangely satisfying looking ability where it fills up the hollowed out section of her blade with Reiatsu and then she sort of like just releases it and it slips out of the end of the sword and goes crashing into Hitsugaya like liquid. It looks really, really cool. Very weird that an attack called Ola Azul is yellow, but... We'll look past that for now. But having used her ability and sent Hitsugaya smashing into the ground, in his Bankai no less, Harabel kind of mocks him. She's like, is this really all a captain can do? And she holds down her blade and she activates her Resurrection Hunt Tiburon. And she gets a really cool transformation ritual. Basically, this massive burst of water comes crashing out behind her and then encloses around her. The water forms like this heart shape before cocooning Harabel, before eventually, eventually, after it swirls and torrents like a tempest, she bursts out of it with her brand new blade and cuts it in two. And this water cage that she was in just kind of crashes and washes over the fake Karakura town. Really badass, to be honest. It looks really cool. Uh, it's a great ritual. Um, and then, you know, you have her resurrection, whether you like it or not, uh, she's now in this new form. And like I said, I think the new sword in particular is really badass, and I do love that you can now see her face as well. It makes the character a whole lot easier to relate with, um, and just gets a lot more emotion across. But I want to bring up this point I mentioned earlier about Harabel seemingly just smashing Hitsugaya in his Bankai form. There's a really weird sense that she was doing a hell of a lot better in her base form than she was in her Resurrection. Because in her Resurrection, all of her water abilities are very easily countered by Hitsugaya, and so the fight ends up slowing to a crawl. Whereas prior to this, she was smacking him around like there was no problem. Ola Azul was going flying towards him, and he seemingly couldn't do anything about it. And so she gets, the, the, she feels like she's heavily neutered, basically, once she enters her resurrection, which is a real shame, I think. But Kubo plays with us a little bit. The moment she transforms, she cuts Hitsugaya in half and she says, you know, the ice dragon falls to the bottom of the sea with a single bite from the shark. 
And she kind of turns to Yamamoto at this point and says to him, you know, I'm going to avenge my Fraction's deaths or their defeats. I mean, that's just hilarious. Like, the fact that she thinks she can go against Yamamoto. I, surely Aizen has fed her information about the Captain Commander that would tell Harabel, who is a reasonably very intelligent character, that she stands absolutely no chance. Especially when her... You would think that her powers might give her the advantage against Ryujin Jaka, but I'm telling you right now... Ryujin Jaka probably is just going to evaporate her water, I guess, at the end of the day. But regardless, Hitsugaya returns to the fight using the Ice Clone, which was one of the most controversial abilities I've ever seen, and people hated it back in the day. Um, but he basically tells her, you know, not to underestimate him. I do want to talk briefly about Harabel's Tiburon abilities, because like I said, a water user is really unique in the world of Bleach. Basically, nobody has this power outside of Kaien's Neji Banner, and... Other than that, I'm totally blanking on characters that have water abilities. I don't think any of the Sternritter do. One of them really should have done. Especially since we've got about three mind control characters, but it doesn't really matter. Harabel's water powers make her really unique because of that. And she has really cool abilities as well. She can basically control and freely manipulate water. You see her moving her massive blade around and this huge wave follows it. Again, it looks amazing drawn in the manga. It looks really, really cool. She can manipulate the heat and the temperature of water as well. She can direct it with her blade. She can fire these small jets of water off the end of her, end of her sword. Overall, I think it's just used in a really cool way. Kubo kind of went all out with basically everything that Harabel can do in regards to her water abilities, and I think it's really great to see. But like I said, the battle between Hitsugaya and Harabel is mostly entirely even as each one tries to eke out the advantage over the other. And like I said, I don't find this battle particularly interesting, and unfortunately for Harabel, Baragun activates his Resurrection at almost the exact same time, and in my opinion, totally overshadows her. Because really, when you think about it, what does the Harabel hitsugaya fight achieve? If you look at it on a very micro level, if you look at it specifically battle by battle, what does the fight achieve in regards to our enjoyment as a reader? We get to see Harabel's release form. We eventually get to see the Shikai of Lisa and Hiori. We don't know what they do. And that's pretty much it outside of like six new abilities for hitsugaya, which I'm sure everybody wanted to see. At least in the Barragon fight, we get Barragon's Resurrection, an awesome moment where he takes Soifon's arm. We get Soifon's Bankai, of all things, and Hachi gets involved in a really cool battle where we get to see great new Kido, and the stakes feel real. Then there's the Stark and Kyoraku and Okitake and Love and Rose fight, which feels like the best fight out of the three of them, in my opinion. On a micro level for us as readers, we get Stark's Resurrection. Kyoraku Shikai ability, Ukitake Shikai ability, Love and Rose's Shikai ability, and that is a pretty good amount. Even with no Barnakai, which there should have been. That's a pretty good amount for one fight. This fight basically gives us nothing and really adds nothing overall, and I find that to be really disappointing in general, and I do think this is unquestionably the worst of the top three Espada battles. That being said, some of the choreography is pretty nice, and it is cool seeing these abilities of ice and water depicted in such a visceral way. Harabel sending a wave of water towards Hitsugaya, Hitsugaya just freezing it, telling her that, he, that she's taking him lightly before throwing an ice dragon back at Harabel, Harabel lifting her blade, activating her biendo, and basically just totally turning the ice into water once again. They're at a stalemate. No one can get the edge on the other person. She can control the temperature, therefore Hitsugaya's ice is effectively useless. And at this point, both of them are just covering the environment in moisture. At one point, Harabel captures all of the water and uses it, bringing it down on Hitsugaya in this huge plume, this waterfall attack called Cascada. Hitsugaya, though, freezes it, basically creates this dome of ice, which actually is a really nice visual. You see the, the frozen water strands like dripping down beside him. He then takes some of that ice and uses an ability called Guncho Surara, where he fires ice daggers up at Harabel. Harabel uh, thaws them out. They turn into water. That water rushes behind her. As it does, Hitsugaya appears behind her, collects that water on his blade, turns it into an ice blade, and smashes Harabel with it. That's probably the best part of this fight. It looks really cool. 
really nice choreography, seeing Hitsugaya thinking like that, knowing that Haribel will thaw out his ice, so he gets behind her to freeze it again before she can do anything about it. But Hitsugaya deduces that because they both use very similar powers, they're probably both waiting for the whole place to be covered in moisture for their ultimate attack. So Hitsugaya decides to go first, using Hyoten Hyakoso, uh, combined with his Tenso Jurin ability to control the weather. And this is undeniably a real spectacle, probably one of Kubo's visually best looking abilities in the series. Harabel attempts to stop whatever is going to happen, but a massive hole opens up in the sky and she is drenched in this almost like flurry, this flurry of white powder that falls down upon her and the moment any of it makes contact with her, a massive ice flower bursts into existence until she is absolutely covered head to toe. And by the time this massive ice flower pillar is finished, Hitsugaya says that her life will be extinguished. But of course I'm guessing Either it doesn't ever get finished, or he is underestimating her again, because although Harabel is currently imprisoned, she's definitely not dead. But I mean, that is effectively it for their fight. This is all Harabel really gets, and there's an odd sense of lethargy to the entire thing. Unlike the Barragan fight, there is no sense of urgency or danger whatsoever, and I think that fight considering Barragan's ability is lacking in it a little bit, this fight is probably even worse. Neither of these fighters are really taking the other one seriously. They are batting back and forth with virtually the same abilities until Hitsugai just decides to end the fight like that. It's a little unsatisfying, I've got to be honest, and it's a shame that Haribel didn't get a chance to really show off more of what she can do. Because if Hitsugai was correct that Haribel was waiting for some ultimate attack, we never get to see it. But this lethargic fighting style might actually be on purpose, as unsatisfying as it can be to watch, as Hitsugaya calls out Haribel for her strange way of fighting after she fires a massive serrow at him off the edge of her blade, which is pretty awesome to be fair. He basically thinks that she is fighting in a way that is literally just stalling the entire time until she can soak the ground enough. So I guess that's fair enough, it just doesn't make for the most enthralling of fights. Later, however, when Wonderweiss arrives, his scream frees Haribel, smashing the ice flower pillar, making me wonder if she could have just broken out of that herself, but she leaps back into battle against Hitsugaya, only to now be confronted as well by the trio team of Hitsugaya, Hiori, and Lisa. And like I said, we get to see their new Shikai as well. However, before the fight really gets a chance to do anything at all, Aizen shows up and having grown tired of the battles, having seen Stark and Barragan fall and realised that the Espada were not as strong as he had hoped they would be, he cuts Harabel down. And this is a really cool moment for her character because she kind of, you know, idolised him in the same way that many of the Iran car did. She felt that he was leading them, that he had a greater cause. And to see all of that crumble around her, to see that she'd not only been tricked, but that the hollows meant absolutely nothing to him. And again, remember that Harabel really cares for her fraction. So seeing them go down in battle, in a battle that apparently means nothing to Aizen, that their sacrifice on the front lines meant nothing to Aizen, causes her to become enraged. And she screams at him as she seemingly impales him through the chest with her massive shark blade, only for it to be an illusion and for Aizen to cut her down from behind and remove her from the fight, seemingly killing her once and for all. But of course, that's not the end of Harabel's story. As far as the canon manga cons is concerned, she just randomly reappears in the Thousand Year Blood War arc and we're supposed to take the fact that she is alive. Thankfully, in the unmasked data book, in the small story Nestle Tonight, we find out that as the battleground was transferred back to Soul Society, there were, of course, a lot of Oranka lying around with serious wounds, and Orohime decided to heal Harabel and her three fractions, sending them back to Waco Mundo. Apparently just left Stark lying somewhere, maybe he was already dead and there was nothing she could do about it, but that's a, that's a shame nonetheless. And so Harabel returns to a changed Waco Mundo, a Waco Mundo left over in the wake of the massive battle, and a Waco Mundo that Aizen has effectively left behind now that he is in prison. There is a vacuum of power here, and so to prevent the place from just falling into utter chaos, Harabel decides to eventually become queen, have this new council of leadership that will hopefully lead Waco Mundo into a slightly brighter age. But of course, the Thousand Year Blood War arc has bad things in store for Waco Mundo, as the Vandenreich appears and they invade the Hollow World as the start of their conquest of the Soul Society. 
this is something I would love to see in the anime because it, we don't get to see it now. Admittedly, it is quite effective not seeing the fall of Waco Mundo because you just assume, you just realise that suddenly the entire territory that was once the villain's territory has gone. It is taken over by the new bad guys. And we find out that Harabel herself, attempting to defend her people and Waco Mundo, was subdued by Yuhabark himself. That, again, sounds so badass to me. Like, I just had this vision of Soldat bursting into Las Noches, subjugating and killing Arankar, Harabel activating her Resurrection and just wiping them out. And suddenly everyone falls silent as Yuhabark himself strides into Las Noches, challenges Harabel. Harabel rushes at him, but maybe he just grabs her blade and smashes it in half, takes her down like just a couple of hits. I'd love to see that. Harabel falling in battle like that is the fall of Waco Mundo. So that would be really cool. And more than that, it's just really weird to me that we never saw her again after that one chapter where Yuhabark says that, you know, he has her captive and Waco Mundo is his. So I feel like there's easily room for a subplot there um, where other characters, maybe the Rankar, Grimjo, Neliel, etc., go and actually rescue her from Silburn. As I said, she is in Can't For Your Own World and she does play a role. But that's pretty much it for our extensive character analysis on the third Espada, Tia Harabel or Tia Halabel, whichever suits you best. I really hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Let me know what you think about this character in the comments below. Were you as disappointed with her tentpole fight against Hitsugaya as I was? I really thought this character deserved better, especially with her really cool and unique moveset. I would have loved to have seen a bit more from one of the only water users in Bleach. But regardless, I still think she's a really cool character, if just a little underrepresented. Guys, make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already. Give the video a thumbs up. Check out Mr. Tomo Talks Games. And until next time, I'll catch you later. I'll see you then.